Hello everybody, welcome back to another video. I'm hoping you guys are all having a fantastic day. So in today's video, as you can tell by the title, we will be talking about the Monster El Nino update that I made a video about in uh, early August. I'm making an update on this because, well, it's been uh, over a month now since I made that video and there have been a few changes and I just wanted to make sure that you guys are all caught up on them. So as of now, September 4th, 2023, it does look as if uh, a very strong El Nino is coming, or at least a strong one, meaning 1 1.5 degrees Celsius or stronger. You can see that the summary, officially, we still have an El Nino advisory issued, so you can see El Nino conditions are observed. They are above average across the Central and Eastern Pacific Ocean, where they have to be in order for the El Nino to occur. And you can see they are pretty confident with at least a 95% chance through December 2023 and February 2024 of an El Nino. Now that doesn't show us anything about the magnitude, but it does show us that they are expecting El Nino, the Climate Prediction Center. Now this is just a little chart I always include. This is basically showing you what makes an El Nino a El Nino and what makes a La Nina a La Nina. So um, basically an El Nino or a La Nina, these are uh, weather events that are kind of called um, El Nino and La Nina based on whether or not the waters in the Eastern Pacific Ocean are if they're warmer by half a degree you could see celsius then it's usually considered an el nino if it's negative then it's a la nina we have been in a la nina the last three years and these weather patterns um uh, or these uh weather events these i guess anomalies ocean anomalies usually have a pretty strong impact on weather events across not just north america but all, all over the uh, the country uh, the world and uh, but specifically i'll be talking about the u.s here because that's where well i know uh, the most and I've always tracked so this isn't going to be anything about Europe or anywhere else unfortunately for those that are watching from other areas um, and uh, also, also anywhere in between the positive 0.5 and negative 0.5 considered a neutral that is also uh, you know a pattern that sometimes takes place that was kind of more of a uh, usually, uh, well, you know, the, the, the impacts of that aren't as definable because it's in between both those phases. But this year, it looks like an El Nino is coming. You can see that we have the global sea surface temperature anomalies. So in case you are struggling to picture in your head where the eastern Pacific is, it's right here. You can see just off the coast of Peru and Ecuador and South America. And whether or not these waters are, again, cooler by half a degree Celsius, that's a La Nina, or warmer, which in this case we are warmer, which is an El Nino, and you can see that for the last four weeks have been continued to be warming. Um, in the last update, they were already pretty, pretty warm, but they continue growing in intensity. <clears throat> Notice that this is the last four weeks, also showing you kind of a week by week dissection. Notice that it gets stronger every week. We have here from the 2nd of August, now here's the 9th, here's the 16th, here's the 23rd, and you can see that that darkest spread of orange is growing. So the waters are definitely warming. You can see this is their updated uh, on August 10th, their kind of their probabilistic Enzo outlook. Sorry about that. And you can see the El Nino is favored through the Northern Hemisphere 2023-2024 with chances exceeding 95%. And do note that as we get towards very late spring, so this is pretty much irrelevant, but I just wanted to make note of this because I think it's kind of interesting. <clears throat> Notice that the chances for neutral are growing, and that's basically indicating that the El Nino probably will be weakening and who knows what we will have into next year. But you can see that for this year, yeah, that that's pretty much a solid El Nino. Now that's one matter, right? Determining whether it's going to be an El Nino or a La Nina. At least we have that. But <clears throat> the other thing is how strong will this be? Because not all Nino, El Ninos are the same. Some have different impacts. If it's a weak one, if it's a strong one, if it's a moderate one. And with the models that we're looking at, you can see a lot of the outliers. There are some that show, uh, you know, the, the extreme outliers on the bottom side that show even a potentially weak El Nino, very weak one, to a maybe even a neutral, to some that are showing a record-breaking El Nino. You know, one has never been recorded before at 2.5, almost 3 right there. Um, again, those are probably both wrong. And most likely, you can see the DYN average, the CPC console, and statistic average, those three bars of blue, purple, and green, all in here. One is kind of on that, march, uh, or on that mark of a moderate El Nino, and a DYN average is showing a, a strong one for sure. So we'll see. You can see that they are showing that uh, an El Nino will persist, and uh, at its peak, a strong El Nino is indicated by the dynamic model average. So we'll have to see whether or not that one is true. Again, at this point, it does look like it will be at least a moderate El Nino. I'm calling it a monster because uh, 
I, I generally think that it could be above 1.5, and we've only had a few of those in the past 100 uh, plus years of, of weather tracking, so going back all the way to 1948, so not 100, a little less than 100 years. Still, it's a rare occurrence, and notice this is another outlook from models. Um, here is, again, the different anomalies, 1.5 degrees, 1.5 negative. Again, here would be that La Nina, here would be the El Nino. You could see last year we were in La Nina, we've made up all of this warm water now, and we are definitely headed into an El Nino. You can see that this this average shows just shy of that 1.5, still a very strong El Nino, just, just not um, as strong as uh, some of the other models were showing. So we'll have to wait and see. Again, this kind of changes pretty frequently. They, they issued this very not long ago, the 28th of August. They actually interesting, is interestingly show a little bit of cooling in the next kind of <clears throat> week, week, uh, week and something. So that will definitely be interesting, but um, I, I do think that, uh, again, we will probably have a strong El Nino. So <clears throat> this is historically, what, or for the last, uh, I think, what is this, like 11? Uh, yeah, a little, a little over uh, ten years, twelve years. Um, how the how the history of these have gone? You can you can see we've been in a long La Nina pattern, one of the longest in in history. You can see 2020, 2021, 2022, and we finally entered a neutral, and now we're really racing. You can see that July average, sorry, that June average was 0 0.8. So that's technically already an El Nino. Um, they haven't colored it in yet. So you can see that previously a 0 0.8 was also highlighted in red. Um, you can see because anything above a 0.5 is El, technically El Nino, so they'll definitely highlight this in red eventually. And we're heading into an El Nino probably by the time OND, ND, NDJ, you know, no November, December, January. That's when this upcoming winter is taking place. That's when we will have <clears throat> the of the El Nino. And the reason I'm showing you this is because for my research analogs that I'll show you in just a second, I took all the years that had a very strong El Nino. So like this one, which was the strongest one ever recorded in 2015, 2016. Now I don't think we'll have uh, an El Nino of that size. However, I do think it will be over 1.5 personally, which still categorizes as a strong El Nino. Notice 2.4, 2.6, 2.6. So I took years like that and there's only been a few since uh, 1948 and I compiled them into an average to look at what those years um, look like for say the month of December and you can see that the surface air temperature of all strong El Nino's looked like this so we had warmer across the eastern United States and potentially the uh, the northern United States and cooler towards the south and west that's generally what you kind of would expect with an El Nino however there are um, uh, a lot of uh, El Nino months that uh, keep that warm air off towards the northwest and instead show cool across the south and east and I'll show you that in in the coming month because this is just one December now you can see January of these years showed a lot more cooler temperatures across the southern United States. Um, so January seems to be one historically with a strong El Nino that favors a lot more cool weather across the south, maybe some big storms, and quite a bit warmer towards the north. You can see some of those anomalies again um, approaching two, even greater than uh, two degrees above average, which <clears throat> for the amount of years that is included here, that is uh, quite an anomaly. Notice February also very similar to January, not similar to December. That pattern continues cool across the south, warm towards the north and west, and that's generally what you expect with El Ninos. Now again, this is all <clears throat> considering a strong El Nino. Now, if I were to take all the El Ninos, say that were weak or even moderate, the, the map would look different. Probably the, the, the heat in the north wouldn't be as profound and neither would be the cool we weather. So with the strong El Nino, it seems we are looking at increased chances of cool weather across the south and warmer conditions towards the north. Now, again, they won't be warmer in the north than compared to the south. This is compared to average. So if it's an average of 70 degrees in, say, Florida, you may be looking at, you know, 65 or something for an average of uh, February. And the same thing goes with the north. If in Montana your average is like 25, you may be looking at an average of 30. So still a lot colder than in the south just compared to average warmer. And this is how it is. This is an anomaly based on average. So notice that the December through February composite, you know, all three months compiled into one image. You can see that there's a pretty um, a, a clear imagery of it being warmer across the northern United States and southern Canada and cooler towards the south. Now, this isn't all this, right? There are definitely outlier years in here. Um, 1966, 1973, of all these years, there's probably definitely a few years that flipped or did something completely different. But we can't really see that because, well, the other years that... Uh, uh, had a, quite a strong indication kind of override that. So <clears throat> we looked at surface precip uh, or sorry surface temperatures. Let's take a look at precipitation because that is also a very important factor. <clears throat> Notice in December of all these years, it actually looks like a pretty wet month for a majority of the United States. There are a few maybe drier spots, uh, surprisingly, across California, and I say that because usually El Nino is pretty wet for those areas. But notice, come January, we see more of that typical pattern where we see drier across the Great Lakes, wetter towards the south, southeast, and northwest and the southwest there. 
February we see a continuation of that more classic pattern. So what we're also seeing is that <clears throat> it seems like January, February, and maybe even March represent something more of a typical El Nino pattern that we would expect um, <clears throat> with, uh, or at least the impacts of the El Nino are a lot more exaggerated and enhanced. And that's usually when their reputation is made. December is kind of an outlier month. It depends on kind of what the fall was, it seems. So you can see the same thing goes with the temperatures. January and February were very similar. December, eh, completely different. So that's also something I've noticed while doing this kind of sur sea surface composite anomaly research. So, um, not sea surface, uh, just surface precipitation and surface temperature uh, composite. So notice again, December, very odd, wetter across the Great Lakes, which usually during a strong El Nino isn't the case, but then January and February both show that. And compiled over, you can see that the January and February override um, December, and we see that drier across the Great Lakes, wetter towards the coastal areas of both South, East, West, and pretty much anywhere the US coast is. So another thing that I wanted to point out about, um, I did this in my prior uh, Monster El Nino video, but in case you guys haven't seen that, is <clears throat> that 2009-2010 um, was a year of a strong El Nino, and uh, obviously this is just one year, not all El Ninos, but I do think that this upcoming year has a lot of similarities potentially with the, with the winter of 2009-2010, uh, um, and it also does generally, this graphic show a pretty good, uh, I guess, depiction of what a strong El Nino does. Usually it's warmer towards the north and west, you can see, not, not terribly, but definitely warmer, and that obviously prevents uh, more more snow cover and snowpack and probably more rain for areas even that are more frequent with uh, snow. You can see heavy rain as those low pressures coming off the south uh, across California, Arizona. Um, there could be some cold snaps. Again, that's the, I like this map for that reason because they, they show that um, while this was specific to the winter of 2009-2010, even during a strong El Nino, cold snaps across the northern United States are definitely possible. In this case, they were pretty frequent. I don't know if that will be the case this year. Notice characteristic and we saw this based off the charts I was showing you the dry weather right across the Great Lakes and into the even the kind of the Ohio River Valley there we have drier conditions which is I think a pretty good bet for this year as we're already kind of seeing that into this fall and I think that'll continue into the late fall and winter notice also warmer potentially across northeast and southeastern Canada that is d definitely typical of an El Nino we've had some very large ice storms in the past in 1998 which was also a strong El Nino year I'm sure many Canadians living in that area remember that ice storm it was absolutely I think it was the most costliest uh, natural event in Canadian history um, at least maybe at that point or maybe even to this date I don't know but it was a monster so obviously those warmer temperatures allowed for the ice to fall as ice not snow and in the south and east is really where things get interesting you can see there's cold frequent winter storms damaging freezes across Florida but also wetness a lot of wet and uh, that means that these storms that are coming out from the west here kind of slide to the south and usually take form into potentially some sort of a larger storm now you can see 2009 2010 was an extreme winter <clears throat> with 60 to 90 inches falling in areas uh, kind of around the mid-Atlantic, which is unprecedented for those areas. But I do think, because if you look at 2015-2016, which was another strong El Nino winter, we saw Winter Storm Jonas, it was that monster, uh, Snow Megadon, across uh, the D.C. that dropped, uh, I think, 29 inches of snow in New York City. It was a monster, right? 2009-2010, also very snowy year. And it, it, you could see Mid-Atlantic also had snowstorms. So I think the Mid-Atlantic region there, Northeast, could see some pretty large systems this year. And that includes the South. Some of these storms will probably spill some snow into these areas, along with <clears throat> a lot of moisture. So even if there's just any available cold, some of that moisture could result in some increased snowfall. Not necessarily even from a man massive storm, but just from some disturbances. There will be also a lot of precipitation. Um, and there's a really bad drought across Louisiana, Texas, so hopefully that does help somewhat. And you can see potentially damaging freezes. Um, I, I don't know about that, that this year. This was, again, 2009, 2010, but again, um, it's definitely a possibility, as I do see a lot of similarities between that year and this year. <clears throat> this is what I was talking about earlier, which is another thing I found really remarkable. Um, you know, during all these El Nino years that I found, it was kind of uncanny. Look, 2016, so 2015, 2016 was an El Nino winter that's comparable to this year's upcoming one. You can see we had that monster storm. Winter storm Jonas, as I was talking about, just dropped incredible amounts of snow across the mid-Atlantic. And then, look, 2009, 2010, February 4th to 7th was also a really, really strong snowstorm that dropped snow across the mid-Atlantic in a very similar fashion. And that was also a strong El Nino year. Moving on. Um, you we have another one that occurred in 2009-2010, but in terms of December, another really strong mid-Atlantic system that dropped, uh, you know, in some areas up to 30 inches of snow, probably even some 40-inch amounts, or sorry, 30-plus-inch uh, amounts maybe in the mountains of West Virginia there. Um, 20... Uh, 
14, 20, 15. So this was a, a weaker El Nino year. So this was something that I think will have a little bit of a stronger one. But even if we do have a weaker one, we still will see potentially an increased chance for Monster Storms. Because right here was a Winter Storm Linus. It was, uh, that's at least what the Weather Channel called it. I don't know if you guys remember it. But it dropped a ton of snow across the Midwest and Northeast. And this occurred during a moderate El Nino year. So these, this snowstorm kind of thesis doesn't only pertain to um, a strong uh, El Nino. It seems to be also with those moderate El Ninos. And that's interesting because with the La Nina, you usually see definitely chaotic weather but it's more uh, more kind of all throughout and not necessarily in these big storm fashions. While the El Ninos definitely seem to favor these monster storms. So that's something I definitely picked up and I've noticed other people on other weather channels have also noticed that, including their own examples, which is also very interesting. Um, and here's an image of uh, kind of a storm headline from the weather channel. <clears throat> and this was uh, a very, very significant system that also occurred in El Nino year of 2015 it was in december they had uh, i mean massive snow for the texas panhandle there a historic blizzard and dropped tons and tons of rain it was it was i think around a christmas time so the impacts of this thing were absolutely i mean it was a goliath of a system so it's also interesting to note here's a picture of that 1998 snow uh, ice storm in canada i was talking about that occurred again last century <laughs> but um it still was during a strong el nino and you can see that again uh, again that big storm slash ice thesis uh, kept up. And by the way, interestingly enough, with this Goliath, I know that from my area here, in uh, Chicago picked up a sleet record. It's never, I think it was like two to three inches of sleet, which has never been never recorded before. So ice also seems to be a thesis among these, um, these uh, storms. Um, and here's an example of that system um, from uh, that, that 1998, which, I mean, four inches of ice, that is almost unthinkable how much uh, how much damage that, that probably caused. So this is my official forecast for what I think will be in terms of the big events uh, for that region. This isn't like my winter outlook. I'll make a video about that soon. Um, so this isn't like temperatures and snow. This is just like, the you know, if the winter ends, what will be the main takeaway from this? And you can see it across the north, northwestern United States, northern plains. I think warm and dry will be the biggest takeaway. I, I do think there will be some cold snaps that come through, but I just, I really think that the warm and dry will be pretty prevalent, unfortunately, for the snow lovers there. Or fortunately, if you don't want a cold winter, I know that the last three winters there across the Dakotas and the Plains, because of the La Nina, have been pretty damn cold, so some people are probably tired of it. Um, I do believe cool and wet conditions will preside across the southwest. Obviously, snowy if it's in the mountains. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if it will be as big of a year as last year, which, funny enough, was a La Nina. Um, you know, the historic snowpack that fell across California and the west last year, last winter. Um, and La Ninas usually uh, present themselves with drier conditions, so maybe it will be the complete opposite, right? Maybe the El Nino will, will result in some really dry conditions. I don't think so. <clears throat> but you can see I do believe cool and wet and snowy and above average winter. So that, that's also some good news for those folks with those droughts going on. Icy. You see that little pink strip? I think there will be some sort of big ice storm that occurs this year as well. Now, I don't know if it will be crippling or whatnot, but I think it will be definitely in some way, uh, you know, headline maker. And uh, it could be anywhere in these areas, up through the northeast there into, you know, maybe the Midwest there into the southern plains. I think that somewhere in that area we could have a nasty ice storm, along with potentially a, a big snowstorm. But again, you can see that preserved that big snow uh, for that mid-Atlantic and northeast, which, I mean, we saw with 2015, 2016, 2009, 2010, all these years that, and they go back even uh, further, all these years have had that big snowstorm. And I think we could see that again with this strong El Nino. Um, which is also definitely very interesting. And uh, again, this could affect even at areas further down towards the south and east Mississippi, depending on how cold it is. And then wet and cool across Florida. There could be also cool uh, conditions that result in increased snowfall here. But obviously, you know, the snow wouldn't be that much. But, um, you know, I, I don't really know if I would want to put snow here across here. And people would be like, how would it snow this far south? It does happen. And I think there's a greater chance of that happening this year. But, you know, that's kind of a hit or miss. And a lot of things need to come right for that. And then you're in the gray. It's kind of like, on, on, I guess undetermined we'll have to wait and see um it may be a bleed over from any of these areas right so if you're in kansas watching this video and you're like uh, eastern kansas and you're or western and you're like which one will i be maybe either uh, I, if i were a betting man i would say probably the ice is probably your biggest threat i don't think this warm and dry will be so prevalent though it'd be the main story for the whole northern united states but at least for these areas um, again, I think this big snow might expand, you know, into further into the northeast or further south into South Carolina. I mean, this iciness could also be much thicker uh, strip as well. So that is basically it, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you all in the next episode. See ya. Bye.